All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Thank you all so much for coming in person. This is a really a special lecture series that we have today honoring Dr. Cryer. We have a wonderful guest in Dr. Rickles. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone who's here in person and continuing and continue to plug coming out in person to our Grand Rounds because we'll be in person, uh, God willing, the rest of the year. So without further ado, I will we'll have uh, Dr. Ana Maria Ar Arbales, who's going to talk a little bit about Dr. Cryer. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to start by thanking all of you guys for attending the fifth Philip Cryer lecture. I think most of us here that have had the pleasure to meet him, we feel fortunate to have him here with us, as well as his children, Justine and Phil. Um, to be able to honor his career and dedication to this institution and the scientific community. For those that don't know Dr. Pryor, um, Dr. Pryor is a professor of medicine emeritus of Washington University in St. Louis. He's a five, sorry, Pi Beta Kappa graduate of Northwestern University. He obtained his MD from the same institution in 1965 with an Alpha Omega Alpha and a highest distinction. He then came to Barnes Hospital, Washington University. Um, School of Medicine, where he received clinical research training in endocrinology and metabolism under the direction of Dr. William Daude and David Kipnis. After his completion of endocrinology training in 1969, he served in the U.S. Navy at the Naval Medical Research Institute in Bethesda until 1971. After that, he returned to WashU, where he spent his entire career and received the Irene and Michael Carl Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Dr. Pryor served for 17 years as Chief of the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, and he also established the General Clinical Research Center, currently known as the ICTS Clinical Research Unit, and served as its program director for over 12 years. Dr. Pryor, let's see if I can get this to move. Oh, I don't think we had the slides up. There we go. Sorry about that. Here we go. Now, Dr. Cryer studied, that one works now? Okay, thank you. Dr. Wire studied the physiology of glucose counterregulation in humans and its pathophysiology in people with diabetes for over four decades. That led his concept of hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure in diabetes, which causes an increased frequency of hypoglycemia in diabetes because of reduced symptoms of hypoglycemia and defective glucose counterregulation against therapeutic hyperinsulinemia. Dr. Pryor is the only person in the history of the American Diabetes Association to receive its Banting Medical for Scientific Achievement, serve as editor of its prestigious journal, Diabetes, and be elected president of the association. His research has also been recognized by many other scientific institutions and associations, including the Claude Bernard Medal of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes and he's received more than three decades of R01 research support and a merit award from the NIH. Probably one of Dr. Cryer's biggest contributions to our scientific community has been his mentoring of more than 40 physician scientists, either in his lab, like myself, or through his scientific interactions, like our speaker, Dr. Michael Rakels. Thank you, Dr. Cryer. Do you want to stand up? Good morning, I'm Max Peterson. I'm an endocrinology fellow in the Physician Scientist Training Program. It's my privilege today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Rickles. Uh, Dr. Rickles is the Willard and Rhoda Ware Professor of Diabetes and Metabolic Diseases at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is also the medical director for the Pancreatic Islet Cell Transplant Program. Um, Dr. Rickles did his undergraduate studies in mathematics and biology at Colgate, uh, and then went to Penn for medical school, where he remained for internal medicine residency, endocrinology fellowship, subsequently joined the faculty and rose through the ranks. He's a tr uh, translational physician scientist who's focused on islet cell function, 
um, and, uh, and hypoglycemia in type 1 diabetes and other pancreatogenic forms of diabetes uh, with a particular focus on uh, islet cell replacement and transplantation. Uh, he's made seminal contributions to our understanding of islet cell function, insulin sensitivity, and counter-regulatory responses to hypoglycemia and type 1 diabetes with that particular focus on, on islet cell transplantation. And also, uh, through work with the large type 1 diabetes exchange registry, um, has helped lead efforts to uh, bring uh, therapies such as continuous glucose monitoring and novel glucagon therapeutics like intranasal glucagon uh, to clinical practice for the prevention and treatment of hypoglycemia. Uh, Dr. Rickles has won numerous awards, not only for research excellence, but also for teaching, for patient care, and for humanism in medicine. He's deeply involved in uh, service to the diabetes research community at the NIH and, and ADA, and currently serves as associate editor for the high impact journal Diabetes Care. Uh, he's mentored dozens of trainees at all levels from undergraduates to junior faculty and um, on a personal note, as a budding clinical investigator myself, it's, uh, it's, it's been uh, wonderful to get to meet Dr. Rickles and, and, uh, and his, uh, his contributions and efforts to use the mechanistic tools of science to better the lives of, of people with diabetes is a, is a true inspiration. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Michael Rickles. Thank you, Max, very much for that uh, uh, very kind introduction. And thank you to Vicki, Anna Maria, Clay, for the invitation to be here and join you in uh, celebrating Phil Cryer. I, I can't uh, begin to um, convey the significance of this honor to me uh, to be able to uh, present the uh, fifth Philip E. Cryer lecture to you today. I'm going to escape from this presentation or just keep going. Okay. Um, so these are my disclosures. And what I'd like to discuss today is the islet lesion in type 1 diabetes and resulting defect in glucagon secretion. Discuss the mechanisms of defective glucose counterregulation leading to the hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure or HAF in type 1 diabetes. Review um, islet transplantation as an intervention for restoring glucose counterregulation in type 1 diabetes and reversing HAF. And further examine interventions for hypoglycemic avoidance by real time continuous glucose monitoring and current automated insulin delivery or artificial pancreas systems as other possibilities for interruption of HAF, and close with um, a look at the use, potential use of mini-dose glucagon for prevention of exercise-associated other non-severe episodes of hypoglycemia. Uh, we, last year, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin. The first uh, patient was treated with insulin in January of uh, uh, 1922. And this is an example of the uh, remarkable uh, effect of restoration of, uh, of life in a young woman affected with uh, uh, type 1 diabetes and, and treated in that first year of therapy uh, 100, 100 years ago now. Uh, insulin hypoglycemia um, was a known complication that became apparent uh, soon after treatment with insulin began. And we had an early description um, uh, 20 years after discovery of insulin of hypoglycemia on awareness in type 1 diabetes, where Dr. Lawrence described in the Lancet changes in the symptomatology of insulin hypoglycemia in diabetes commonly occurs as years of treatment go on and insulin reactions may differ so much from the original ones that patients are dangerously unaware of their onset. And uh, and so this uh, condition of hypoglycemia and awareness increases the risk for experiencing severe hypoglycemia episodes by as much as 20 fold. And data from the uh, type 1 diabetes exchange show that currently adults with type 1 diabetes receiving uh, care at specialized diabetes centers across the United States 
Um, 7% will report experiencing a severe hypoglycemic event resulting in seizure or loss of consciousness in the prior three months. And this is despite a, a, a rapid increase during this uh, observation period in the use of continuous glucose monitoring. So this uh, remains a real problem for our patients uh, uh, even today. And, and importantly now with current insulin analog and delivery systems, um, have, occurs irrespective of the hemoglobin A1C uh, level. In addition to the, the morbidity associated with severe hypoglycemia, there's important mortality that occurs uh, uh, with severe hypoglycemia, which is the leading cause of death in our younger patients with type 1 diabetes. And with continuous glucose monitoring uh, uh, comes the evidence that the Denbed syndrome of type 1 diabetes is explained by severe hypoglycemia occurring with failed glucose counterregulation uh, uh, prior to death. So uh, to understand the, the development of hypoglycemia and type 1 diabetes beyond merely uh, um, uh, overuse of, uh, of, of insulin uh, dosing at a particular moment in time, uh, uh, start by looking at the islet um, histology in type 1 diabetes. And this is work from the human pancreas analysis program using imaging mass cytometry to quantify the endocrine cellular components um, in individuals, um, uh, deceased, unfortunately deceased donors with type 1 diabetes who um, are, were uh, evaluated uh, soon after diagnosis or with longer disease duration. And relative to the control pancreas that were examined, you see that early in, uh, in type 1 diabetes, there may be residual uh, beta cells present, um, uh, but over time, uh, these are progressively lost, and, and the vast majority of, of the islet is made up by glucan-producing alpha cells and delta cells, pancreatic polypeptide, and, and ghrelin-producing epsilon cells. What's important to note is that for the uh, glucagon response to hypoglycemia, this, this is uh, um, the case of someone with five years of diabetes duration, where beta cells are found are in some islets and some lobules of the pancreas that have not yet been involved with the autoimmune process. But the vast majority of the islets throughout the pancreas um, look like this, where they have um, glucagon uh, producing alpha cells, but no beta cells present in the islet. And uh, work done by Phil has uh, elegantly showed how there's important paracrine signaling between the beta cell and the alpha cell within the islet to activate uh, glucagon secretion during hypoglycemia. And so that you can see that with the majority of islets devoid of any functioning beta cells, um, that this uh, process can't happen. And uh, the, the, the best in vivo uh, evidence of, of this at onset of diabetes comes from work that Anna Maria uh, um, uh, performed with euglycemic followed by hypoglycemic clamping of um, uh, young individuals at the onset of type 1 diabetes and then after a year of establishing uh, uh, glycemic control and intensive insulin therapy. And what you can see is that at, at the onset of, of diagnosis and without any improvement with intensive insulin therapy after a year, the, the glucagon response to hypoglycemia is markedly impaired relative to that of control individuals. But importantly, the um, epinephrine response, which becomes a key counter-regulatory uh, defense against development of, of further hypoglycemia, is entirely preserved at the onset of, of type 1 diabetes. And so this serves as a key defense towards uh, severe hypoglycemia early uh, in the course of type 1 diabetes. Uh, but what Phil has uh, uh, made seminal contributions to our understanding is how invariably uh, hypoglycemia, uh, even uh, mild non-serious hypoglycemia occurs commonly in the course of insulin in treatment and, and certainly with years and decades of type 1 diabetes. And specifically, Phil showed in both uh, with uh, work done with uh, uh, Simon Heller and Sam DeGogo-Jack that the experience of hypoglycemia on one day uh, induced experimentally um, uh, uh, here in the laboratory led to a blunting of the autonomic symptom response to hypoglycemia in both non-diabetic individuals as well as individuals with type 1 diabetes on the subsequent day. 
And so the, the typical autonomic warning symptoms of sweating, palpitations, tremor uh, were uh, si significantly blunted by a prior exposure to even mild hypoglycemia. And in addition to the blunting of the autonomic symptom response came an impairment by prior day hypoglycemia to subsequent day uh, epinephrine response to hypoglycemia. So this key counter-regulatory epinephrine response is, uh, is, is impaired by the experience of, of hypoglycemia. And so what we, what we um, know about the, uh, the normal response to decline in plasma glucose is that these primary islet cell responses, meaning that the islet will turn off insulin secretion uh, and that that serves as a paracrine signal during hypoglycemia for the alpha cell to increase glucagon secretion normally is sufficient to change the insulin to glucagon ratio exposed to the liver to increase endogenous glucose production and maintain normal glycemia. But with near total beta cell loss in individuals with type 1 diabetes, they lose both the ability to remove insulin that's now been administered exogenously, and they lose the paracrine signal to activate glucagon secretion. And so this leaves uh, individuals dependent on the secondary autonomic responses. But as uh, Phil has shown, the hypoglycemia induces autonomic failure of these responses and uh, takes away the ability then of um, having a backup for increasing glucose production to prevent the development of worsening hypoglycemia. Phil also um, showed us how uh, this process feeds in a, in a forward cycle. So this uh, vicious cycle of hypoglycemia begets hypoglycemia, as described by Phil, includes components where exercise um, I, um, both leads to an increased risk for hypoglycemia uh, during exercise, but also blunting uh, counter-regulatory responses to, uh, to subsequent hypoglycemia, as well as sleeping, an important period where there is both an impaired awareness of symptomatology and a blunting of the counter-regulatory responses. And so um, uh, this you know, daily life of an individual with type 1 diabetes sets up a process for increasing risk of hypoglycemia. So, um, so uh, two of Phil's former trainees, um, uh, Carmen Finelli and Sam Dogo Jack, looked at scrupulous avoidance of hypoglycemia in individuals with um, hypoglycemic unawareness on its ability to restore autonomic symptom and uh, counter-regulatory epinephrine responses to hypoglycemia. And what they showed is that with, uh, uh, after as short as three to four weeks, and certainly by three, three months, the autonomic symptom response to hypoglycemia could be uh, restored in these uh, individuals with either short duration, uh, less than 10 years shown on the left, or longer duration, uh, more than 10 years shown on the right. Um, and, uh, but importantly, the, the epinephrine response, while improved in the individuals with short diabetes duration, uh, was not normalized. And in fact, there was no improvement in the epinephrine response to those individuals with longer disease duration. And, um, and this also required a increase in hemoglobin A1C for individuals to achieve this hypoglycemic avoidance. And while um, these studies were, were done many years ago and set this foundational basis for uh, uh, reversal of hypoglycemia uh, unawareness, uh, in today's practice, it became very hard to convince individuals to accept a higher hemoglobin A1C level that, that they associate with increased risk for vascular complications of their disease. So we first got interested in approach for uh, attempting to interrupt the cycle of hypoglycemia and type 1 diabetes through um, islet transplantation. Um, and this involves the procurement of a pancreas from a deceased donor who does not have diabetes. Uh, the pancreas is brought to a current good manufacturing practices uh, laboratory where the pancreas is uh, collagenase digested, centrifuge purified, and then the islets are delivered to the portal vein of a recipient with type 1 diabetes using a percutaneous transhepatic access uh, uh, performed in interventional radiology. This provides a, a minimally invasive alternative to a whole pancreas transplant um, and, and as well places uh, um, islets 
in the um, in the liver where um, first pass extraction of insulin glucagon occurs as would normally um, uh, happen from a release from the pancreas. So uh, the first cell therapy cure of type 1 diabetes uh, was uh, reported in the journal Diabetes uh, by Phil, Phil Cryer working here at Washington University with David Sharp and Paul Lacey. Um, and, and this was really a catalyst to the proof of concept that cell therapy uh, uh, could indeed be a future cure for individuals with type 1 diabetes. Now, the uh, insulin independence experienced by uh, this first individual uh, was short-lived, but it led to a uh, 10 years later report by the Edmonton um, uh, a group at University of Alberta, a protocol that led to consistent and more durable uh, insulin independence um, in individuals with, with type 1 diabetes. So as a um, uh, first year endocrine fellow, um, Ali Naji did the first ILA transplantation at University of Pennsylvania now it, uh, in 2001. And, um, and here we were attempting to replicate the Edmonton protocol at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the, the, the data that was being uh, collected on patients. So these are capillary uh, blood glucoses. And you can see this uh, individual had uh, marked glucose variability. Um, and uh, significant hypoglycemia prior to the infusion of islets from a, from a single donor pancreas that led to immediate elimination of hypoglycemia, but suboptimal control of hyperglycemia until they received islets infused from a second donor pancreas about a year later that led to a, a prolonged period of, of durable insulin uh, uh, independence and normal glycemia. Somehow I froze. PowerPoint is reloading. <laughs> oh. Start a slideshow from here. I'm sorry. Should we just close PowerPoint and start it? I think we may be able to do restart. There we go. Okay. All right. So I was fortunate at that time to have uh, mentorship at Penn from uh, Mitch Lazar, my chief at the time, who encouraged me while we saw these first um, ILA transplant cases being done at Penn to consider working with uh, the new ILA transplantation program. Ali Naji, the uh, director of the program, transplant surgeon and, um, uh, and immunologist, uh, was delighted to have uh, an endocrinology fellow involved with the program and was extremely supportive of my involvement. I received metabolic mentorship from Dr. Teff and something <laughs> is happening again. Okay. Um, uh, metabolic mentorship from Dr. Karen Teff, who was uh, uh, then program director of our uh, General Clinical Research Center. And a consistent message I received from all three of my mentors at Penn was you have to study Phil Cryer's work. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I took that to heart and it was actually easy uh, for me at the time because Susan Mandel, our fellowship program director, gave each new fellow a copy of Williams textbook of endocrinology. And so I was very, uh, uh, was able to pull right off my shelf um, uh, the Williams textbook and read Phil's chapter on glucose homeostasis and hypoglycemia. And so this was in the, the ninth edition. Phil has uh, gone on to uh, write this chapter through eight editions of Williams textbook of endocrinology and this really provided the the foundational base for my understanding of 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 what was known and what we needed to think about in terms of addressing the question of 
response to hypoglycemia in, in recipients of ILA transplants. I spent the next year reading as many uh, of Phil's papers as I uh, as humanly could be be done, and then attended my first American Diabetes Association meeting in 2002. And that was when I, I met Phil for the first time and started a, a, a habit. I probably was like a puppy dog, uh, accosting Phil at the end and in between sessions with questions about the methodology we were setting up. And that followed then with uh, early preliminary data with help on interpretation, um, affirmation of next steps, and then uh, uh, most importantly, constructive criticism that was so key to helping me uh, guide uh, the program and our, our and the development of my career over the years, and so uh, for that, Phil, I will forever be grateful. Thank you. Two of Phil's papers that had a, um, a extremely important impact on, on me setting up the methodologies that we were going to use at Penn were his uh, uh, descriptions of using uh, hyperinsulinemic paired U and hypoglycemic clamps to really get at. Uh, not just the activation of counterregulatory systems, but the glucose uh, level at which these systems were activated, the glycemic thresholds. And so um, these two papers served as a model for the methodology we set up at Penn and unabashedly copied Phil's uh, uh, methods uh, identically. So this is a two-step hyperinsulinemic um, hypoglycemic clamp that we conducted in normal individuals, those who'd undergone islet transplantation about six months earlier, as well as individuals with type 1 diabetes who were on the wait list for islet transplantation and so uh, had hypoglycemia on awareness. And um, those with uh, uh, type 1 diabetes received insulin overnight in our research center to avoid hypoglycemia, as well as try to achieve a reasonable glucose um, uh, around uh, in the low 100s, prior to the start of the uh, CLAMP experiment. Um, ILA transplant recipients, um, uh, for the most part, have a somewhat impaired fasting glucose, but maintain a, a reasonable uh, starting glucose. And then the, the, the uh, controls have a very, very normal uh, fasting glucose. And we um, targeted every hour and a half steps of 80, 65, 55, and finally 45 milligrams per deciliter to examine the, the um, uh, ultimately, the glycemic threshold at which activation of counterregulatory mechanisms might occur. And um, the first results that, uh, uh, and I remember being very excited showing these early data to Phil at the time, was this, this, there was some question in the field about whether islets transplanted in the liver could respond to hypoglycemia given uh, glucose fluxes that occur um, in, in the hepatic tissue. And so uh, this was the uh, data on the beta cell response measured by C-peptide, where uh, we show relative to, in type 1 diabetes, there's no measurable C-peptide, so they can't turn off insulin secretion during hypoglycemia. But our ILA transplant recipients were able to turn off insulin secretion identically to that in the, in, uh, the non-diabetic control individuals, suggesting that the islets transplanted in the liver are sensing and responding to hypoglycemia appropriately in turning off insulin secretion. So that we, we would hypothesize would provide the paracrine signal necessary to increase glucagon secretion in response to hypoglycemia. And when we looked at the alpha cell response, we could see for the ILA transplant recipients, the response was impaired. And, uh, and so relative to, to normal, um, others would have interpreted this as being absent or not present. Um, but uh, we had included uh, uh, study at the same time of our type 1 diabetic control group, where uh, you can see insulin that inhibits glucagon secretion showed far greater suppression of glucagon during the hypoglycemic clamp. And so this difference of glucagon between the allotransplant recipients and the type 1 diabetic individuals, we, we suspected could be explained by release of glucagon during hypoglycemia from the transplanted islands. So to ensure that that was due to hypoglycemia, this is where having the euglycemic control experiments is critical. So we could show that under hyperinsulinemia euglycemia, glucagon from the ILA transplant recipients is, is suppressed identically to that in the uh, normal control individuals whose data is shown in the gray shaded region. And, and, and that during hypoglycemia, there was indeed a significant increase in uh, glucagon release 
during hypoglycemia. So we were also interested in the autonomic responses that the avoidance of hypoglycemia we observed clinically in, in these patients might achieve. And, uh, and this shows at six months following out of transplantation that the, um, that the, the really uh, markedly impaired epinephrine response in the individuals with type 1 diabetes was significantly improved um, uh, six months following out of transplantation, albeit um, certainly remaining less uh, than normal. And with the uh, autonomic symptom response, uh, again, prior to transplantation, the, um, the symptoms were not different from those during euglycemic control experiments, but following out of transplantation, there was a, a normal both magnitude and even a left shift of symptomatology occurring earlier in the individuals who'd received allo transplantation than seen in our non-diabetic control uh, subjects. Um, this six-hour hypoglycemic clamp uh, protocol and the use of the euglycemic control experiments to define where um, responses should be at each point in time uh, allowed for the uh, defining a glycemic threshold where the hypoglycemic response measure exceeded the 95% confidence interval of data from the euglycemic control experiments. And so there we could show even if the glucagon epinephrine um, uh, responses achieved a magnitude that was less than normal, uh, they started at an appropriate glycemic threshold. So the lower limit of a normal uh, 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 plasma glucose level, 70 milligrams per deciliter, is uh, defended by the activation of glucagon. Uh, and if uh, failing that by 65 milligrams per deciliter, epinephrine, and with uh, conditions of, for example, prolonged fasting by 55 milligrams per deciliter growth hormone and cortisol, and eventually autonomic symptoms. And showing here a normal uh, glycemic threshold for activation of all these counter-regulatory mechanisms in the allotransplant recipients, um, and that was significantly uh, impaired in those individuals with type 1 diabetes. So we move from uh, uh, that work done with the Edmonton protocol to um, a protocol developed by the Clinical Out Transplantation Consortium, which was an NIH-sponsored multi-center study aimed at developing a, a standard operating procedure for the manufacture of islets and uh, phase three uh, clinical trials to support eventual licensure of islet transplantation. And so this is, um, our goal was really focused on improving the intrahepatic islet engraftment and survival. Um, uh, shown here is uh, Ali Naji working uh, with uh, Chen Yang Lu, who directs our islet isolation facility. Um, uh, they're uh, holding the islet bag that is uh, and, and massaging those islets towards the um, uh, portal vein catheter that's being um, held by the uh, resident of our interventional radiologist, uh, Rich Lansky Goldberg. And, work done at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, where they co-incubated islets prior to um, uh, intraportal infusion with uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, uh, show that the uh, islets uh, distribute throughout each lobule of the, of the liver um, and eventually uh, revascularize by the hepatic arterial system. And so um, what we were, uh, able to show with uh, the CIT07, which was an arbitrary uh, number assigned to the protocol for um, islet alone uh, transplantation. Um, in work that we did with the 11 uh, subjects transplanted at Penn um, under, this, under this protocol, we showed that the beta cell secretory capacity that we determined from a glucose potentiate arginine test um, uh, was significantly greater than um, uh, than work we'd done with the Edmonton protocol in insulin independent um, uh, islet recipients. And while with the Edmonton protocol, uh, individuals always receive two or more uh, uh, islets from two or more donor pancreases, um, with our 11 patients in the CIT07 protocol, seven received islets from a single donor pancreas, four received islets from a second donor pancreas. And so we had about a threefold improvement in the uh, surviving um, of functional islet mass. Um, uh, uh, with CIT07. And if we look at the beta cell secretory capacity measure uh, over time, we can see that it was remarkably stable with a few individuals even uh, landing in the normal range of insulin secretory reserve. The one patient returning to insulin during the first two years of 
a follow-up was was that individual with the lowest um, established uh, 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 beta cell secretory capacity as a measure of their functional um, islet mass. When we examine uh, glycemic control here with uh, showing continuous glucose monitoring with uh, data pre-transplant where um, uh, each uh, color line represents uh, interstitial glucose from a, a different day, we see that there's uh, marked glucose variability, uh, significant hypoglycemia, particularly nocturnal, and very little time spent in the normal glucose range of 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. In fact, the time spent there is only passing through from hyper to hypoglycemia. Um, whereas uh, following uh, islet transplantation, uh, there's uh, no time spent with hypoglycemia and there's a, a normalization of glucose variability such that all time is spent in the normal glucose range. So here we had the opportunity to look longitudinally at a counter-regulation with the same individual studied pre-transplant, six months following transplant, and 18 months following transplant. We contracted our hypoglycemic clamp protocol to the four hour with hourly steps of 80, 65, 55, and 45 milligrams per deciliter. And again, in, in gray shaded region is the euglycemic control um, uh, data where uh, the glucose was held between 85 and 90 milligrams per deciliter. And uh, we also added a stable glucose isotope to these experiments so that we could um, uh, quantify uh, both the um, endogenous glucose production as well as uh, peripheral glucose utilization uh, during uh, hypoglycemia. And uh, showing here again the beta cell response, um, what I want to highlight with, uh, with this slide is how during hyperinsulinemia euglycemia, insulin also inhibits its own secretion, so the islet transplant recipients um, suppress insulin secretions measured by C-peptide similarly to normal controls during hyperinsulinemia euglycemia, and that, with, and that further with the hypoglycemic clamp, again, insulin secretion is turned off entirely as is normal. And, and here, the glucagon response, again, uh, absent in individuals with type 1 diabetes prior to islet transplantation and no different than euglycemic uh, conditions. And that at both 6 and 18 months following transplantation, we see an increase in glucagon um, uh, that is stable over time and consistent with the beta cell secretory capacity that was on average in this cohort about 40% of normal. Our, our glucagon response was about 40% of that found in our uh, 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 non-diabetic control individuals. And uh, here, as we went beyond the, uh, we uh, reconfirmed at six months, we could see an improvement in the epinephrine response to hypoglycemia. But by studying individuals again after 18 months showed that by, by then we had entire normalization of the epinephrine response to hypoglycemia. And, and, uh, and progressive left shifting of this uh, restoration of the autonomic uh, symptom response, again, you know, being absent in these individuals prior to islet transplantation. Using uh, our stable glucose isotope, we could show that the um, uh, endogenous glucose production is a measure of hepatic um, glucose output during hypoglycemia, again, that was absent in individuals uh, and not different from from suppression of hepatic glucose production that comes with, with hyperinsulinemia um, under euglycemic conditions was entirely, uh, uh, was normalized um, in the islet transplant recipients at both six and 18 months following transplantation. And uh, together with that, the uh, lipolytic response to mobilize free fatty acids to serve as a fuel for hepatic glucose production um, was absent prior to transplantation and uh, uh, and restored to normal following transplantation. So what we, we, uh, we show here is that by replacing um, islets in type 1 diabetes and restoring these primary islet cell responses, sufficient hypoglycemic avoidance can be achieved to allow for improvement and ultimate uh, uh, full restoration of the secondary autonomic responses and allow individuals uh, normal defense to protect against development of hypo glycemia. So, so, in, so this really encouraged us that if we could achieve sufficient hypoglycemic avoidance by other means in islet transplantation, we might also be able to 
um, uh, reverse components of hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure. So we next tried that with real-time continuous glucose monitoring. And, um, and so here, um, a real-time continuous glucose monitor provides alerts and alarms um, so that the individual who may be unaware of the onset of hypoglycemia can, um, uh, can still um, uh, respond by ingesting carbohydrate and uh, subverting uh, further uh, uh, severity or uh, prolonged duration of their exposure to hypoglycemia. And while uh, continuous glucose monitoring certainly does a terrific job in helping to lower the incidence of severe hypoglycemic events, um, the overall hypoglycemic avoidance in, in, a, in another cohort we studied with hypoglycemic um, unawareness was, was really modest. So there was uh, some reduction in exposure to hypoglycemia uh, during uh, uh, daytime hours when uh, folks are most uh, uh, easily able to respond to their alerts and alarms. Um, but we didn't receive uh, very much improvement in time spent with hypoglycemia during the, the nocturnal uh, period. Um, while clinically folks were having fewer severe hypoglycemic events, uh, there was still ongoing exposure to biochemical hypoglycemia um, uh, over 18 months of follow-up. And so with that, we saw um, no improvement in the epinephrine response uh, at six or 18 months. Um, in this cohort of individuals, although we did see a modest improvement in uh, autonomic symptoms um, over time, and hepatic glucose production uh, improved modestly just at the 18-month uh, point uh, following our intervention, but without any change in glucagon, which I didn't show, or epinephrine, um, we, we speculate that there may be um, mechanisms of, of hepatic autoregulation that are presumably neurally mediated that might uh, result in, uh, in some of that uh, improvement in endogenous glucose production. But be that as it may, there's still significant de counter-regulatory defects present despite the use of continuous glucose monitoring. So our next step was to uh, 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 use an artificial pancreas system uh, for automated insulin delivery. And uh, shown here is a Medtronic uh, 670G, uh, which is an insulin pump uh, that is informed by uh, uh, the uh, interstitial glucose uh, sensor uh, reading from this continuous glucose monitor. And uh, here we were interested to see if we could achieve greater hypoglycemic avoidance uh, to interrupt uh, the cycle of hypoglycemia. And so uh, this is an, uh, in another cohort of individuals with uh, type 1 diabetes hypoglycemia and awareness. Now, uh, for the most part, uh, everyone's on continuous glucose monitoring. Here's uh, a week of, of daily tracings from an individual who has, um, a, again, marked glucose variability, frequent hypoglycemia, and uh, very little time actually spent in the normal glucose range of 70 to 180. Um, this is uh, on the 670G uh, automated insulin delivery system, where you can see that the system provides automated uh, increases of, uh, of insulin, now, I'm just realizing that you don't see the pointer. There we go. Uh, here are automated increases of insulin delivery um, uh, to subvert uh, uh, hyperglycemia, but most importantly, automated suspensions of insulin delivery that prevent the occurrence of hypoglycemia uh, occurring here overnight. And uh, these automated increases, and again, importantly, suspensions also prevent uh, interprandial occurrence of hypoglycemia. And so this individual is now um, able to uh, spend a day avoiding all hypoglycemia and uh, about 67% of the time spent in the normal glucose range. We were very interested in how this affected sleep associated hypoglycemia. And so rather than define an arbitrary uh, period of midnight to 6 a.m. as, as nocturnal, um, uh, we use uh, uh, actigraphy with actigraph watches worn um, uh, for uh, three weeks uh, uh, every three months in order to um, uh, couple uh, um, actigraphy data, sleep diaries with the continuous glucose monitoring and determine exactly when individuals were 
sleeping in terms of our uh, potential effect on uh, uh, automated insulin delivery to uh, reduce sleep associated hypoglycemia. And so uh, this work was, um, uh, th this study was completed and this work analyzed by a, a talented postdoctoral fellow, Annalisa Flatt, who's been in our lab for the past uh, two years and comes from uh, Newcastle University in the, in the United Kingdom. And uh, Annalisa presented these data at the American Diabetes Association meeting this past June um, and showing that uh, during times that individuals were awake, automated insulin delivery uh, significantly reduced their time spent with, uh, with hypoglycemia. Um, and that uh, most importantly, uh, overnight while individuals were asleep, uh, virtually eliminated uh, uh, exposure to hypoglycemia. Um, and so um, with this, uh, I wanna first point out that our counter-regulatory baseline in these individuals was interestingly set right at where we uh, ended after 18 months of intervention with real-time continuous glucose monitoring, meaning that since these folks all came in receiving continuous glucose monitoring, their autonomic symptoms were where we saw individuals at the end of our prior study, and their endogenous glucose production was also uh, somewhat better than what we'd seen historically in this uh, a group of, uh, of patients. Um, but that with the uh, automated insulin delivery intervention, again done for an 18 month period, we saw both six and further 18 months now in a significant improvement in epinephrine secretion during hypoglycemia, um, and as well, uh, uh, a significant improvement in autonomic symptoms during hypoglycemia, um, albeit that was uh, only significant at the 18 month uh, time point. And we were curious about why we weren't seeing a movement in autonomic symptoms at six months. And so when we looked at the individual autonomic symptom responses, um, we did see that um, palpitation, sweating, tremor, were all going up already at six months and further 18 months. And we had this uh, a strange, very elevated baseline for hunger symptomatology in these, uh, in these individuals that uh, was lower at six months before increasing again at 18 months. So if you take hunger out of the, uh, uh, out of the scoring, uh, you do see for the more specific um, uh, symptoms of, uh, of, of hypoglycemia, a progressive improvement from six to 18 months uh, of this automated insulin delivery intervention. I'm sorry, we're not responding again. Oh, there we go. Um, now, disappointingly, uh, the hepatic glucose production response was unaltered um, during uh, the course of this, of this study. So uh, despite the, the increase in epinephrine, we didn't see any further um, improvement in endogenous glucose production during hypoglycemia. Although we did see a significant reduction in uh, the rate of glucose disposal, indicating that peripheral glucose utilization uh, was decreased uh, progressively at six and 18 months, presumably mediated by the increase in, in epinephrine. And so here um, uh, we feel that the um, avoidance of hypoglycemia was sufficient to improve the autonomic responses of increasing epinephrine secretion and autonomic symptoms, albeit in the absence potentially in the absence of um, an effect of glucagon secretion to in, in, uh, help with increasing endogenous glucose production, we did not see an effect of this improvement of epinephrine secretion to increase endogenous glucose production. And that could also uh, uh, need a, a more normal uh, uh, response of epinephrine to achieve, but we, uh, we did see a decrease in peripheral glucose utilization, which likely does provide uh, physiologic benefit in terms of defense against hypoglycemia for individuals on these systems. Um, we also looked at some of the heterogeneity of the improvement of epinephrine, so to, um, so to, which could explain some of the um, lack of benefit seen in endogenous glucose production. And so this just shows that for um, individuals with very long diabetes duration, 46 years, who achieve an only modest reduction of of time spent uh, with hypoglycemia uh, had no improvement in uh, epinephrine during the course of the study. Uh, here's an individual with 29 years diabetes duration who had 
um, a, a, a you know, fairly substantial reduction in hypoglycemic exposure who saw a modest improvement of epinephrine after 18 months. And so, uh, and, and here an individual with uh, 20 years diabetes duration who had a, a substantial reduction in time spent with hypoglycemia, who had more epinephrine secretion at baseline and that was able to subsequently increase further already at six and at 18 months following the automated insulin delivery intervention. And so, um, so these factors certainly are going to play an important role in how indivi individual uh, uh, persons with type 1 diabetes respond to recovery of glucose counterregulation. And this uh, shows the data for the cohort that the, that the improvement in epinephrine at six months um, uh, was related in a, a hyperbolic fashion to the uh, time spent with hypoglycemia uh, with inflection of around 2%, which is lower than the 4% currently recommended by the American Diabetes Association for uh, time spent with hypoglycemia. But then of course, diabetes duration also plays a significant role in, um, in the ability of individuals to increase epinephrine secretion during uh, hypoglycemia. And so for, um, for residual um, uh, time spent with hypoglycemia, another uh, strategy to uh, eliminate that, that residual daytime exposure uh, uh, could be by targeting exercise associated hypoglycemia is one example. And so this is, uh, um, uh, continuous glucose monitoring and automated insulin delivery using now the a tandem system where again automated suspensions overnight prevent uh, sleep associated hypoglycemia. Um, but when this. Uh, whoops. But when this individual um, uh, exercises, um, we can see that the. Uh, system suspends insulin delivery, but this isn't sufficient to prevent the development of hypoglycemia during exercise. And um, we know from work done um, at, uh, at the Mayo Clinic that whereas a, a non-diabetic individual during uh, the onset of aerobic exercise uh, turns off insulin secretion and turns on glucagon secretion, these mechanisms don't occur in the individual with type 1 diabetes, where despite suspending insulin delivery at the start of exercise, there's actually an increase of insulin absorption from the subcutaneous space of already uh, administered insulin, such that you have an actual increased exposure to insulin and no increase in glucagon that predisposes to hypoglycemia development during activity in type 1 diabetes. We looked at, at um, addressing this using a mini dose glucagon intervention, 150 micrograms, as opposed to the 1,000 micrograms that are in a one milligram emergency kit, and showed that um, a mini dose of glucagon could entirely uh, prevent the development of hypoglycemia that would normally occur during 45 minutes of aerobic activity in individuals with type 1 diabetes, whether they reduced insulin delivery or not, um, and also led to less post-exercise hyperglycemia than occurs with standard use of, of uh, glucose uh, uh, ingestion at the start of exercise. And the uh, insulin levels shown here were no different regardless of uh, uh, condition, including that for insulin uh, reduction. And that only with the pharmacologic administration of glucagon was there an increase in glucagon uh, during uh, uh, exercise to explain the prevention of, of hypoglycemia. Um, uh, under that condition. And so, uh, so to break the cycle of hypoglycemia that gets hypoglycemia, um, we feel that there uh, may be a few interventions, uh, such as the use of native glucagon surrounding exercise or at predicted times of, of, uh, of non-severe hypoglycemia, uh, that together with automated insulin delivery that's been shown to remarkably address sleep-associated hypoglycemia, we might be able to um, uh, uh, get rid of hypoglycemia for patients with type 1 diabetes. So to summarize, the absent islet cell responses in type 1 diabetes predispose a cycle of hypoglycemia that gets hypoglycemia, resulting in impaired glucose counterregulation and the syndrome in half, as been so eloquently uh, detailed by Dr. Cryer. Islet transplantation restores appropriate islet cell defenses against the development of hypoglycemia and demonstrates near complete avoidance of hypoglycemia for more than six months 
um, restores autonomic defenses against hypoglycemia, reversing half. Hypoglycemic avoidance by real-time continuous glucose monitoring or more robustly using automated insulin delivery, especially during sleep, can restore hypoglycemia symptom recognition, but only partially improves glucose counterregulation and longstanding type 1 diabetes. And finally, the near complete avoidance of hypoglycemia may require restoration of glucagon secretion or action, especially during exercise, with cellular therapy or pharmacology ultimately required for reversal of half in all affected individuals. I'd just like to uh, acknowledge um, the members of my lab at University of Pennsylvania, uh, especially um, uh, Annalisa Flatt, who did uh, much of the work of, uh, involved in the automated insulin delivery project, and my, uh, of my collaborators at Penn, especially my mentors, uh, Karen Teff and Ali Naji, um, and our uh, funding support from the NIH, JDRF, Helmsley Charitable Trust, and uh, WW Smith Charitable Trust. Um, uh, thank you very much for your attention. This is a great talk. Thank you so much. We have time for questions, and the QR codes are up, but Carlos? So my, um, what is no known about the complications of either transplantation in the liver? So is the levels of insulin producing fatty livers? Because I assume that there is an increase of production tremendously in, a, in an area which produces transformation of fatty pores and differentiation. Yeah, Carlos, that's a great question. There's there's been well described this uh, areas of periportal steatosis that can develop where there is regional increased glycogen storage and fat storage within the liver, um, but the the actual amount of the liver that is in close enough proximity to where the islets are to be affected by that process is so small that we don't see a, uh, a, a global increase in steatosis. And, and other work that we've done has actually shown that there's, a, there's an insulin resistance in type 1 diabetes that improves with islet transplantation. And so, um, uh, so these individuals have uh, are, are as insulin sensitive as uh, non-diabetic controls um, following the procedure, and so I think in in the context of a, of an insulin resistant population, you might drive higher insulin production that could lead to a, a, a more uh, widespread process throughout the liver. But we have not seen uh, that uh, in, in in studies to date. So why do you think the response to the hunger symptoms didn't jive as well as all the other symptoms? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, we've 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 often, you know, wondered, I'm curious what Phil thinks about uh, about the hunger symptom. We've thought about, you know, just, you know, tossing that one, focusing on on the others. Um, uh, but but I don't know. That's the first time we really saw that come up. So um, I think it was you know kind of bad luck and we'll just kind of keep keep going with it. But uh, it was interestingly for that group at baseline, that was really their only symptom that went up uh, during hypoglycemia was was hunger, but it went up, it went up substantially. And then I guess they were, as other symptoms were occurring subsequently, they were maybe less tuned into their hunger symptomatology is perhaps it, my, yeah, my maybe best. It's a different mechanism or driver that's not responsive in the same way. Yeah. So your initial histology slide showed nicely that delta cells are still, you know, alive and kicking in, in patients with type 1. And I just wondered, do you think there's any role of somatostatin dysregulation? I know there's some rodent studies that where if you antagonize SSTRs, sometimes there's a claim that you can decrease hypoglycemia, presumably by increasing glucagon. But I just wondered if in any of your clinic studies, you ever looked at somatostatin or if you've seen any changes there. It's pretty complicated because obviously it also suppresses insulin, but. Yes, we, we, um, we have not examined somatostatin, um, although um, uh, uh, when I visited um, UT Southwest, Rod, Roger Unger encouraged me to try to think about how to look at that as well. And, uh, and so we've, we've, we've set up an assay for somatostatin for perifused islets, um, um, where, but the extraction and plasma required and the fact that the 
peripheral concentrations are so small relative to what's happening within the islet. Um, we haven't uh, uh, validated an assay for somatostatin in the, the, you know, the, the whole patient in vivo situation. So it's a really terrific question, but, um, but I, I don't, I'm afraid I don't have an, an, an answer for you. Thank you very much. That's it. That's okay. <laughs> that was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.